unloading the ventricle, improving survival, anterior infarct. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to be sort of a, a warm-up for uh, Naveen, who's going to tell you the really cool, interesting stuff in terms of the per-protocol analysis that we did with DTU. Uh, but going back a little bit historically, this is obviously a classic slide that all of us know. Uh, it really set the concept for uh, myocardial salvage. Uh, in the, it, it, we be, it became recognized uh, a century ago that patients could survive an acute myocardial infarction. And then in the 60s and 70s, it was recognized that acute coronary thrombosis uh, caused acute myocardial infarction. And you could survive, but there was a sort of time dependency. And this gradation, uh, 40 minutes led us to a small infarct, uh, three hours a more extensive infarct, and then by 96 hours, the infarct was complete. And so this wavefront of necrosis has kind of uh, been with us uh, uh, for many years, uh, but it's been difficult uh, to really analyze this. One of the great difficulties we've had in actually proving that any therapy could decrease infarct size is the measurement. Uh, we don't have all these necropsies, fortunately, in human beings, and so we, we had to come up with other methods of directly or indirectly measuring infarct size. We know that uh, that in, uh, back uh, in my journey started in 1978. I was a second year uh, cardiology. Uh, I was a second year resident at Wayne State University. Uh, Dr. Arnold Weisler was doing things called uh, systolic time intervals because in in the 70s there was no way of analyzing ventricular function other than with a contrast ventriculogram, and people weren't going to be getting contrast MI. So Dr. Weisler had me uh, interview and call 136 survivors of patients with acute myocardial infarction, and we did these non-invasive, just amazing. You should look it up sometime in terms of how complex it was, but it was a very accurate assessment of ventricular function, and this is before radionuclide ventriculograms. And so what we found in patients that had well-preserved style of ventricular function, the, uh, the survival is outstanding. And those that had poor ventricular function over five years, a dramatic decrease in survival. And so this is kind of where I was starting in my uh, scientific career and really trying to analyze uh, methods of, of decreasing infarct size because we knew that if patients had a large infarct after, after survival from an acute MI, they would have a poor long-term prognosis. And so then in, uh, in May of 1980, I was fortunate to be at the University of Michigan when we started doing our first intracoronary streptokinase trial, uh, a patient with an acute coronary occlusion. We drip streptokinase, and then we saw that the artery was reperfused and, and open, and it was just really uh, breathtaking to see this, that we could actually open up infarct arteries, because prior to that time, there was no way of, of, of decreasing infarct size because the patient's uh, the infarct would be all completed. Now there is a possibility that we could open up the coronary arteries and by this way get timely reperfusion reestablished and, uh, and open up uh, and improve myocardial function. Uh, this was the first study that, that we did in 1983, uh, Fareed Kaja, that was at Henry Ford Hospital. And I was uh, a, a first-year fellow at the time in this trial looking at contrast ventriculograms. And uh, the study was negative, okay? So we were enormously infused in, in, in interested in streptokinase, but we did a contrast ventriculogram at the start and at hospital discharge. And, and in comparison, well, streptokinase opened up 80% of the coronary arteries, uh, control only 20%. But you can see a couple of things about this that have been one of the problems that have kind of haunted us even to this day. Number one is that there's a huge heterogeneous uh, 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 size of infarction, anterior more than more than inferior, but uh, overall there's such a, a large play of patients coming in with in, with infarction that it's very difficult uh, to find differences uh, without doing hundreds and hundreds of patients. And and so the clinical trials that were being conducted in the 70s, 80s really couldn't have the power to show benefit. And the other thing that was really important is that uh, we all understand that there's compensatory hyperkinesis of the non-infarct zone. So the anterior wall could be completely uh, akinetic, but the inferior wall could be hyperkinetic, and so the global ventricular function or ejection fraction could be preserved with still having large infarction. So that, that was uh, part of the problem. Uh, we we, we uh, were able to do regional wall motion analysis, uh, but still there was really very little proof that thrombolytic therapy improved ventricular function. And that still is a, is a problem that I think has not been uh, f uh, finally assessed. Uh, we not, so that was look, looking at injection fraction. Finally, in the uh, 90s and, and early 2000s, we were starting to look more at technician system, maybe uh, in imaging, and this was, uh, was, was an excellent way of finally de determining the size of infarction. 
uh, it, more recently, a, a cardiac MRI. And I think that's finally the tool that's going to really allow us uh, in detail to look at the size of the infarction. Now, we, we learned uh, quite a bit about, uh, about this, and, and, and this is data that presented in 2005, uh, looking at the time dependency salvage in, in patients with anterior infarction. And you can see that if the patients come in with less than two hours of symptom onset, they have a very small infarct. So unequivocally, if you can get the artery open really rapidly, you're going to do more than anything you possibly can for de decreasing in infarct size, but there's a, there, there's a large gradient, and after about three hours, you, you really are not going to be able to do very much. Now, in the United States, um, in patients, the average time from symptom onset to presentation is 1.6 hours. So if you tack on 90 minutes to door to balloon time, then all of these patients are getting reperfused at sort of three and four hours after sy symptom onset, and that's really why Although we dramatically decreased the door to balloon time in the United States, we haven't really changed the mortality for acute infarction in the last 20 years. It's just because it, it's very difficult to get the patients open very, very quickly. Another reason that in the D2 trial, we said that we were not going to include anyone with less than one hour so from presentation to uh, from symptom onset to presentation, because getting the artery open in those patients is really crucial. But afterwards, uh, so there's got to be a time uh, independent methods of decreasing infarct size in order to further improve myocardial function and myocardial salvage. So what happens, and again, you guys have seen, have seen this uh, frequently in terms of, of the sizing, uh, patients that have small infarcts, uh, the apex can be slightly uh, hypoarachnotic, and then uh, they, they will remodel. If the, in, if the infarct is large, uh, the apex and anterior wall becomes akinetic. Over a period of time, the ventricle dilates and remodels, and then the sequelae that we've heard about from this morning happens. And, and so what, you, what, we, what we need to do is, is decrease um, uh, infarct size to the point that the ventricle will positively re remodel. Now, we have a wonderful opportunity with DTU because we are going to be getting um, sequential uh, cardiac MRI at three to five days and also echocardiograms at three to five days and at time of hospital discharge. So in the pilot that we performed, we, we, we analyzed this data on CMR and, and try to find is there, is there a number, a percentage of infarct size uh, that is going to be the target that we need to treat. So there's such heterogeneity of all these patients so that at the end of the day, after at the time of hospital discharge, uh, is there something that we can use that will be prognostic in terms of this patient's going to do great, ventricular function is going to be normal, they're going to have a great, great survival, or this patient is going to do very poorly, they may need a defibrillator, they may need advanced heart failure therapies prior to the time of hospital discharge. I think one of the things that has really caused um, uh, uh, the interventional community to be a little bit uh, complacent is that the hospital discharge for these patients, the mortality, is really low. In an anterior infarction, you should consistently get non-shock mortalities of under 5%. And so everybody's saying, we're doing great. But we're not seeing the patients at, at one to five years when a lot of those have already kind of had large infarctions and started getting the sequelae. So, um, so, so there are other uh, uh, tools. That, unfortunately, we know that, uh, that balloon pumps have been useful, uh, and they really haven't had a, a much of a benefit in terms of improving infarct. It was neg negative. Uh, uh, the uh, the CRISP-MI did not show any benefit in terms of decreasing CMR infarct size. Uh, there is one uh, agent, again, that I think we have to consider, which is uh, supersaturated oxygen. And there, there have been two studies. We, I led the AMI HOT1 trial, and uh, the combination of AMIHOT1 and AMIHOT2 showed that the CMR infarct was significantly reduced. So that is the one FDA-approved therapy for uh, decreasing infarct size, and it's something that we're going to have to compare when we're talking about the benefit of, um, of uh, uh, unloading with, with, uh, with Impella. Uh, now, Naveen is going to tell you all of this about the D2 trial, and we did see that the area at risk was significantly reduced in the patients with some ST segment elevation greater than 6%. So I think that, and he'll go into it in more detail, but what I want to focus on for the last few minutes is, is what we're looking at right now and what we've already shown uh, with the CMR and the ECHO data. So in the patients that were treated in the DTU study, there were 50 patients that were randomized, and there were 40, 41 that had a CMR at three to five day hospital discharge, and then uh, there are 39 that could be analyzed in this cohort. So, so this, is, this is data, again, small numbers, but I think are really uh, useful and instructive about where we can going uh, with, a, with, a, with a pivotal trial. 
Uh, and, and what we found is if the patients, so divide the patients into those that had LV mass less than 25% versus those that had LV mass greater than 25%. On the left, you can see what happens to the ejection fraction. If the patients have a, 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 a large infarct, the ejection fraction is flat over 30 days and then, over, uh, and then in, in the echo over 90 days. In the patients that have an infarct size that is, that is less than 25% of LV mass, the ejection fraction significantly increases in both the uh, CMR and, and, at, and at, the, at, at 30 days and at the echo at 90 days. So these, these data are quite consistent. And, and also what we find is in the patients that have large infarcts, that left ventricular and systolic and end diastolic volumes increase. And so it's exactly the same thing uh, that, that Bart showed us earlier this morning at the first lecture, is that the ventricle does start to adversely dilate, adversely remodel. But we, we think that the threshold is at around 25%. Now this is, we're gonna have to do a more detailed analysis, but I think we are gonna be able to find sort of a cut point, and I'm hoping that we can use that as a, um, as a surrogate endpoint for efficacy. So at, at the end of the day, whatever happens, whether you use agents, a timely reperfusion, whatever, we're going to need something that, that is going to be a useful tool for us for the patients that prior to hospital discharge. So I'm, we're going to push this and with larger sample size. So now it, we have an enormous opportunity with DTU uh, with, to have hundreds of patients with CMR data and with echo and serial measurements. And I think we're going to be able to refine this in a way that's going to be useful for clinicians. I, I honestly think that um, that doing a CMR uh, at, within the next few years should, will become the standard of care for measuring efficacy of patients with anterior infarction. Uh, the other data that I think is really fascinating, this is the echo data that we had, and again, dividing the patients into those that had small infarcts versus larger infarcts, looking at the specific segments so that, so zero is, is akinetic and, and one is normal function, going across in the patients that have small infarcts versus larger infarcts, and you can see that, it, it, again, on the left-hand left side at three to five days, the mid cavity is, is where a lot of the action is. Uh, on the left of each of the diagrams is the small infarct, on the right is the large infarct. And you can see the mid cavity at three to five days is very severely hypokinetic in the large infarcts. It's somewhat hypokinetic. And then probably more importantly, at the apex of the ventricle, the, the, the apex in the large infarcts is completely akinetic. And, and in the patients with small infarcts, there, there's, there is some akinesis, but it's much smaller. There's a lot of hypokinesis. Now then at 90 days, uh, the, 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 the basal seg segment is completely normal uh, in the large, inf in the small infarcts. In the mid cavity, the basal seg, the, 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 the mid cavity is nearly normal. Uh, there is some hypokinesis of the mid cavity. And then in the large infarcts, uh, at, at uh, the apex is completely akinetic at, at 90 days. So what this tells you is that un unfortunately, I think the battle is done at, at 90 days, at, at, at three days. And it, you can either do a CMR or, if you don't have that, an echocardiogram and, and doing an echo. And at, at, at prior to hospital discharge, if the anterior wall is very akinetic, uh, that's not going to come back. And I think that that's really important for us to understand and, and will be very helpful prognostically for our patients. So uh, we now have had a chance to analyze some of the data from the from the um, roll-in phase of, of the current uh, as trial. Uh, because of sensitivity, I can't really show you sort of primary uh, uh, data, but I, I can tell you that there is a, uh, a in the in the patients that we've analyzed so far, and, and this is in in the. Uh, uh, in, in the data that we can look at for the Roland cases, which are not going to be part of the trial, uh, we know that about two thirds of the patients are are leaving the hospital with with the LV mass less than 25 percent. Uh, in the in the pilot, numerically, we found more patients that had small infarcts in the active treatment. So that's really the the, the hope is not only we're going to have uh, specific numbers, but also percentages of patients that are going to end up with infarcts less than 25 percent. I think is going to be an interesting analysis. It's not part of the early, not, it's not part of the original analysis, but we will have some subsequent uh, follow-up data with that. And then uh, a few interesting uh, PITS data, again, that we can look at from this phase now. And these are now with larger numbers of patients. Uh, TIMI-3 flow at, 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 at baseline is very helpful. And we all know that if you have TIMI-3 flow at the start, you're going to have small infarcts. If it's TIMI-01, you're going to have larger infarcts. And, and, and so this now data uh, really corroborates that and, and shows that, that uh, getting 
uh, early reperfusion uh, is, is super helpful in decreasing infarct size, and it's going to be one of the variables. One of the variables that we have to take into account uh, in, in analyzing all of our information, and then um, and then in terms of time, and, and the Infuse MI trial uh, showed this. But if you reperfuse within three hours, you're going to end up with a smaller infarct than if you reperfuse greater than three hours. So really re-emphasizing re the data that's been present before. So I, I think that we're going to have an incredibly rich data source to be able to look at uh, to really try to analyze this in, in a more mechanistic way uh, in terms of decreasing an infarct size. So I'd, I'd conclude that um, the lessons that, that we've learned is that early revascularization is obviously the most potent intervention in these patients with anti-infarctions. But unfortunately, most of these patients don't arrive soon enough to benefit. There have been multiple strategies that have failed to limit infarct size. Uh, uh, there is some data from Amistad that suggests that, uh, that uh, adenosine may be useful. Uh, supersaturated oxygen uh, has a, a, a large signal. signal. Uh, it really hasn't become very widely adopted in the United States for uh, multiple reasons. And then uh, I think that unloading with an adequate sample size uh, is going to be a, a, a very effective therapy. And we have some really great uh, promising clues. Now, the, the whole hope is that we're going to rapidly recruit and finish this trial, but, but I'm really uh, super optimistic about where we're going to be with DTU. Thank you very much.